Fans with split personalities jammed into the Meadowlands last Sunday to watch a contest that was tailor-made to induce confusion and Mad Hatters everywhere. New York's Giants were playing New York's Jets in a New Jersey football stadium. And throughout most of this battle for Big Apple bragging rights, the Jets demonstrated a little to brag about. Hands of stone plagued the Jets, and so did the iron-willed defense of the Giants, who made number 31 Marion Barber the unwilling participant in a stripping act that could have played in a Times Square burlesque house. Miscues like this were a key reason why the Jets were down 17 to nothing by the third quarter. And when the Giants weren't jumping on Jet mistakes, they were pouncing on Ken O'Brien. But when the gutsy O'Brien rebounded to connect with Lamb Jones number 80, the Jets made a respectable accounting of themselves late in the game. Jones' touchdown brought the Jets to within 10 points of the Giants, but they were unable to overcome a lead that had been forged on the strength of touchdown runs by Rob Carpenter and number 20, Joe Morris. There's an old saying that a house divided cannot stand. By the time the Giants had sewn up a 20 to 10 victory and earned themselves a first place tie in the NSC East, those in attendance had their hats turned squarely toward the Giants' side of the field. Minnesota fans haven't been quite so ecstatic about their team or its new coach. Last week, some of them took to raising their glasses to the good old days when they were able to take certain things for granted. Like a stingy defense, something that wasn't much in evidence from the very first play of the game against the Washington Redskins. Number 89, Calvin Muhammad's 68-yard touchdown reception propelled Washington to a 31-0 halftime lead. This was obviously going to be one of those games when the Redskins could do no wrong. And even when they did, it somehow turned out right. After Joe Jacoby, number 66, parked himself on top of Keith Griffin's fumble for another Washington touchdown, Viking fans needed even more bud, and probably a few Meister Browns. To make matters worse, the Redskins proved that they could capitalize upon Minnesota's miscues as well as their own. The Redskins' 31-17 win enabled them to maintain a share of the divisional lead. And while Minnesotans may desire less steckle, what the Vikings really need is more talent. What Dallas Cowboy fans really need is more sensible hairstyling. This may pass for the new wave look in some quarters, but this fellow looked like a starfish and attached itself to his head. The Dallas defense, however, was very stylish indeed. And when Dennis Thurman, number 32, attached himself to an errant pass, the Cowboys were on their way to giving the Eagles a hairy time of it in Philadelphia. Philadelphia's listless offense was put to bed early, thanks to a Cowboys pass rush that saw to it that Joe Pisarczyk got plenty of sack time. Dallas's seven sacks included a safety registered by number 78, John Dutton. But while Pisarczyk had a tough day, Danny White's performance wasn't exactly the stuff of legend either. In 25 attempts, he completed just eight passes, but one of them resulted in a 57-yard score. Number 20, Ron Springs' touchdown was the only offense that the Cowboys would need in a 26-10 victory that was carved by their defense. A lot of people are saying that the Cowboys aren't as good as they used to be. But this year's bunch is as gritty as any of their predecessors. To prove it, they've got a 9-5 record and are locked in a three-way tie for first place in the NFC East. It doesn't matter that the hairstyles of their fans have changed. The men with the stars on their helmets are still a team to be reckoned with.
Desperate not to disappear beneath the large shadow being cast by the division leading Redskins, Giants, and Cowboys, the St. Louis Cardinals were in a must-win situation last Sunday. Quarterback Neil Lomax kept his team in reach of the leaders by keeping the football well within the grasp of his receivers. Doug Marsh's touchdown reception put St. Louis on top 7 to nothing, And the Cardinals added to their lead by victimizing the Patriots the same way they had been victimized in recent weeks. After committing 19 turnovers in their four previous games, the Cardinals finally took back some of what they had given away. Number 59 Thomas Howard's touchdown helped boost the Cardinals to a 33-10 win. While St. Louis's 8-6 record still gives them high hopes for a playoff spot, empty dreams are all that remain for the Buffalo Bills and Indianapolis Colts. With a combined record of 5-21 going into last week's Battle Royal, the sooner their disappointing seasons are swept under the rug and forgotten, the better. When two good teams play, the skill level increases. When two not-so-good teams play, just the opposite holds true. Number 21, Donald Wilson's bungled punt return resulted in a safety for Indianapolis. With the remainder of the season essentially meaningless, the Colts are hoping to accomplish something by giving Art Schleister the opportunity to prove whether or not he's the team's quarterback of the future. This touchdown toss to Frank Middleton earned Schleister some positive points. Unfortunately for the Colts signal caller, he wasn't the only young upstart trying to make good. With starter Joe Ferguson sitting this one out on the bench, number 19 Joe Dufick set out to make Ferguson stay on the sidelines a permanent one, as he hooked up with number 87, Tony Hunter, for a first quarter score. A second year player out of Yale, Dufick is one Ivy Leaguer who utilizes his brawn as much as his brain. His strong-armed 64-yard touchdown play to Byron Franklin helped give Buffalo a 21-15 victory, its second win of the year. When the regular season ends, home is the only place the Bills and Colts are headed, as are the Packers and Bucks. But last Sunday, Tampa Bay defensive end John Cannon decided he wasn't about to go home empty-handed. Both teams experiencing seasons as dismal as the playing conditions, the Bucks were the first to begin cleaning up their act. Running back James Wilder's touchdown heave to Adger Armstrong gave Tampa Bay a 14-0 third quarter lead. However, as the field became more treacherous, so did the Packers. Quarterback Lynn Dickey led the offense through the muck and mire for 27 unanswered points to give Green Bay its fifth win in the last six weeks. While the Packers are getting a little momentum going that hopefully will carry over until next year, the Denver Broncos' need for momentum is a bit more urgent. Having had their 10-game winning streak snapped a week earlier by Seattle, the Broncos' trouble-free season suddenly seems to be caving in from every direction. Denver has already clinched a spot in the playoffs. However, their grand illusions of a division championship are beginning to slip away. Wreaking havoc with the Broncos' fate was Kansas City quarterback Bill Kenny, who set up three Nick Lowry field goals and passed for a touchdown to Carlos Carson to give the Chiefs a 16-13 late game advantage.
Bronco kicker Rich Carlos for the second week in a row hit the goal post attempting to send the game into overtime. The Chiefs held on to their lead for win number six. Since Marty Schottenheimer took over as head coach, the Cleveland Browns have been singing a different tune, winning three of their last five games. And last Sunday against the Cincinnati Bengals, quarterback Paul McDonald combined with rookie Brian Brennan to make some more beautiful music. The Browns appeared to be sitting pretty, while the Bengals were hitting sour notes until backup quarterback Turk Schoner connected with Stanford Jennings, number 36, on this 15-yard scoring play. Twelve different receivers got a taste of the action for Cincinnati, but it was the special teams that added a little spice and a Bengal boost. This was the first block punt of the season for the Bengals, but that milestone was overshadowed by the end zone debut of mammoth tackle Anthony Munoz, a conspicuous target for third string quarterback Boomer Esiason. Munoz scored on a tackle eligible play with one second remaining in regulation to send the game into overtime. While his effort was a source of inspiration, kicker Jim Breach provided further reason for exultation as he hit a 35-yarder to clinch Cincinnati's 20-17 victory. While the Browns couldn't slam the door on the Bengals' playoff hopes, in Houston, those playful, unpredictable Oilers continue to remain in contention for respectability while making it difficult for the Steelers to prove their credibility. After his teammates' rendition of Follow the Bouncing Ball, Warren Moon orchestrated a more conventional drive as he eclipsed the fourth-ranked Pittsburgh defense for 300-plus yards and two touchdowns. Number 88, Chris Dressel's score contributed to a 10-point Oiler lead at halftime. But the Steelers soared back and forced yet another crucial AFC Central contest into sudden death. Joe Cooper's decisive 30-yard kick signaled big trouble for the Steelers, who now hold a shaky one-game lead over the Bengals with but two weeks remaining. The 23-20 decision was Pittsburgh's first ever loss in overtime and led to some much-deserved Oiler rejoicing, something this young team has practiced only three times this season. On the other hand, in Seattle, the faithful who flock to the Kingdom have great cause for celebration, especially due to the splendid play of nine-year veteran Steve Largent, for whom practice has truly made perfect. Against the Lions, Largent notched his 11th and 12th touchdowns and etched his name in the team record books. Gary Danielson, meanwhile, was leaving his own mark all over the Seattle defense. James Jones' touchdown kept Detroit in pursuit of Seattle and an upset. But when Danielson started aiming for helmets instead of hands, the Lion attack began to be tamed. While the Seahawks defense lassoed Detroit in the second half, holding them scoreless, Dave Craig unleashed a torrid passing exhibition for the second consecutive week. Craig fired into the end zone a club record five times, twice to Daryl Turner, number 81. This deadly duo demonstrated that the Seahawks are not just one of the sharpest defensive teams in the league. This 51-yard bomb put the icing on the cake as Seattle creamed Detroit 38-17. Their eighth victory in a row was the sweetest to date as it elevated the Seahawks alone atop the AFC West, guaranteeing them a taste of the playoffs for the second straight year. Riding a seven-game losing streak, Atlanta head coach Dan Henning has looked long and hard for a silver lining in a dark cloud of a season. 
A little sun did burst through, though, when the Falcons' Alfred Jackson caught a personal best 11 catches for 193 yards and a touchdown against the visiting 49ers. But Jackson's individual sparkle was tarnished by the balanced deficiency of the San Francisco attack. Joe Montana passed for just 165 yards, but two first-half heaves wound up in the end zone, one to Dwight Clark, number 87. The 49er defense was equally productive, forcing six turnovers and scoring two touchdowns of their own. One occurred when Gary Johnson rumbled 33 yards with a Falcon fumble for a touchdown that helped hand Atlanta their eighth straight defeat and up the 49ers record to a league best 13 and one. The smile that Richard Todd flashed prior to the Saints meeting with the Rams vanished in a sea of royal blue and gold once the game got underway. Todd completed one pass, was sacked four times in the first quarter, and threw two interceptions. Leroy Irvin's 51-yard return marked the beginning of the end for the Saints as the Rams went on to build a 24-0 lead behind the running of Eric Dickerson, number 29 who enhanced his chances of breaking the 2,000 mark with 149 yards. It was the 20th time in 30 NFL games that Dickerson has run for over 100 yards, and he now needs 222 more to top O.J. Simpson's single season high. New Orleans backup quarterback Dave Wilson was rushed in to salvage some self-respect. And Wilson responded with three touchdown passes to bring the Saints to within six points in the final period. But the Rams dampened any hope of a Saints comeback when Jeff Kemp threw his second touchdown pass to Henry Eller, good for 34 yards and a 34 to 21 win that made the Rams a front runner in the NFC race for the playoffs. Indeed, it is that time of year when some teams come unglued trying to wrap up a playoff spot. Not so for the Raiders, a team that puts their money where their mouth is come December. And on Sunday, their first big play left Dolphin fans speechless. After driving to the Raider three-yard line on their opening possession, a Dan Marino pass intended for Mark Duper wound up going the other way by a Raider cornerback, Mike Haynes, number 22. Haynes' 97-yard interception return was the longest in Raider history and set the tone for a game abundant with big plays from both sides. One in particular made history. Precisely 12 minutes and 19 seconds into the first period, Dan Marino hit Jim Cephalo with his 37th touchdown pass of the season. A milestone toss that put him one better than Y.A. Tittle of the 63 Giants and George Blanda of the 61 Oilers. The touchdown tied the game at seven, and from that point on, the lead changed hands four times. The Raiders' Marcus Allen scored the first of his three touchdowns to earn Los Angeles a four-point halftime advantage. The Dolphins rebounded and went on top in period three when Mark Clayton caught two more Marino touchdown passes, one good for 64 yards. But the Miami lead was about as safe as the ball was in Clayton's hands. Clayton got this one back, but the game bounced from the Dolphins' grasp in the final quarter. The game breaker occurred when LA's Mark Wilson avoided the Miami rush long enough to spot a streaking Doki Williams. Williams got a lock on Wilson's pass and went 75 yards to put the Raiders on top for good. The second Marcus Allen touchdown extended the L.A. lead, but with just over three minutes remaining, Marino connected with Mark Duper with his fourth touchdown pass of the game, his 40th of the year. 
But Marino's 470 passing yards could not guarantee victory, especially when Marcus Allen completed his hat trick with a 52-yard touchdown dash that clinched the 45-34 Raider win. The 45 points equaled the most ever scored against the Don Shula coach Miami team. And though the Raiders are not yet number one, they are a step closer to the playoffs with an excellent chance to become the first team in five years to repeat as NFL champions.